This is the final section in the modern physics topic. This section is called the four fundamental forces of nature. What I'd first like to talk about is just exactly what a force is. A force is defined as the effect on a particle due to the presence of another particle. Now, particles can be as small as quarks. Now, you know that quarks are what protons and neutrons are made up of. So since protons are neutro and neutrons are so tiny to begin with, quarks must be even smaller. So particle can mean a very tiny particle, like for example a quark, or a very, very large particle, like for example a star or a planet. So again, the particles that we're talking about, that forces act between, this would be attractive forces, pulling things together, or repulsive forces, pushing things apart, the range of particles is enormous. It can be from tiny quarks to huge stars, planets, and everything in between. For example, these two magic markers, because they have mass, they have a gravitational force that is attracting them. But since the gravitational force is so weak, I can just pull them apart. I am stronger than the gravitational force between these two markers right now. My, my applied forces are much, much stronger. What I'd like to talk about now a little bit is how exactly, how exactly forces are created according to the theories that we have at the present time. We believe that forces are caused by carrier particles, little tinier particles that move between the particles that are being attracted or repelled. I'd like to give you an example of how this might work. Imagine on an ice skating rink, you have two people on ice skates, and one of those people is holding a ball. Let's just say it's a basketball. The people are on ice skates, so let's assume that we have a frictionless situation. Because of the law of conservation of momentum, if this person, for example, this person on the right, were to throw the ball to the person over there, when this person threw the ball, this would be the, the, the ball would be the example of the carrier particle, this would be the particle, this particle and this particle. The people represent particles that are going to be repelled from each other via this carrier particle. These people are not going to touch each other. This is a non-contact force. They are not actually going to touch each other. They're not going to push each other. But they are going to throw that basketball back and forth between them. And you know from the law of conservation of momentum, that when this person throws the ball to that person, this person has some recoil backwards, some recoil speed backwards, and actually when this person catches the ball, this person also starts moving back in this direction. When he catches the ball, when he throws the ball back to this guy, he again has some recoil velocity back in that direction, when this person catches the basketball, he heads that way. So you see, if these people continue to throw that ball back and forth between them, they will be repelled without ever actually having to touch each other. So again, this is an example of how carrier particles can cause a repulsive force. These are the two particles that are being, the, the people represent the two particles being repelled, and the basketball represents the carrier particle going back and forth between them. All right, so now we're going to look at some examples. I'd like to next look at an example of two protons and at least two of the forces between those protons.
Now, you know that protons are positively charged. And you know that protons have mass. Because they are two protons would be positively charged, they would repel each other with an electrostatic force. Like charges repel via the electrostatic force, Fe. But because the protons also have mass, they're going to be attracted toward each other by the gravitational force. So what we're going to calculate now is which one of these forces, Fe or Fg, is actually stronger. Which force is going to win? So we go to our reference tables and we look up the equation for the electrostatic force. The electrostatic force would be K Q1 Q2 over R squared. We're going to calculate how strong the electrostatic force between two protons is. All right, so here we go. We go to the front of the reference tables. We look up K. K, the electrostatic constant, is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Now, Q1 and Q2 are the charges of the two protons. So we would have 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's one proton. And the other proton, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Now, it doesn't really matter how far apart we put the protons, because when we calculate the gravitational force, we'll put them the same distance apart. I'm going to choose a fairly large number. Right, I'm going to choose 0.1 meter apart. And we see that that needs to be squared. The distance between the, pro the protons is a tenth of a meter or one decimeter. All right, now, I'm going to do this math, and we're going to see exactly how strong the electrostatic force. Now, we know that's a repulsive force. Two protons are going to repel each other. We're going to calculate how strong that force is. 8.99 E9 times 1.6, negative 19. Do the math on your own also, please. Check my work. All right, times 1.6, negative 19. Okay, and I'm going to divide that by 0.1 squared. And I am getting an electrostatic force of 2.30 times 10 to the negative 26. It is a force. The unit is newtons. So Fe is 2.30 times 10 to the negative 26 newtons. We're going to need to remember that number. So I'm going to put that number right up here so we can remember it. All right, the electrostatic force between two protons is 2.30 times 10 to the negative 26 newtons. All right, now, here we go. Let's calculate Fg. And you're also going to see how very similar these two force equations are. So to calculate Fg, the gravitational force between the two protons, we're going to use the formula G m1 m2 over r squared. <clears throat> and here we go. Capital G, the universal gravitational constant, is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Make sure if you're doing a part two on the Regents exam that you put this unit correctly. All of your units have to be correct. There's no sense losing points because of incorrect units. Now, we need the mass of a proton and the mass of another proton. All right, so the mass of a proton right here, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The other proton is the same, obviously, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And the same distance between them, 
0.10 meters squared. All right, let's calculate the strength of the gravitational force, the attractive force, between these two masses. So we have 6.67 E negative 11 times 1.67 E negative 27. All right, multiply that again, 1.67 E negative 27 equals, I'm going to divide that by 0.1 squared, and we have 1.86 times 10 to the negative 62. Um, I'm going to double check that. 1.86 times 10 to the negative 62. That can absolutely be correct because it's a very, gravitational force is very, very tiny. I'm going to double check that though because that's not the same as a number I got earlier and I'm not sure which one here is actually going to be correct. Um, 1.67, not a bad idea to double check your math. I have a feeling this one's going to be right that I made the mistake earlier. Negative 27 equals, all right, divided by 0.1, divided by 0.1. 1.86 times 10 to negative 62. Okay, I'm going with this one. All right, here we go. Fg equals 1.86 times 10 to the negative 62 newtons. All right, so what we see is that the electrostatic force that is repelling them is 10 to the negative 26. The gravitational force that is attracting them is 10 to the negative 62. So obviously this one is much, much stronger. The protons will repel. Now, imagine the protons all in the nucleus of an atom. All right, I'll draw um, a lithium atom with three protons. All right, lithium, seven, three. Three protons, four neutrons, not really concerned with the neutrons at the moment. One, two, three protons, and one, two, three, four neutrons. What we see based upon these calculations is that the repulsive, the repulsive electrostatic force is much, much stronger than the attractive gravitational force. What should happen is that these protons should fly apart. They should be repelled by this much stronger force. They should all be heading in opposite directions. Essentially, the nucleus should explode. So, the question is, what is holding the protons together in the nucleus? I'm glad you asked that question because I have a wonderful answer for you. What's holding the protons together is another force of nature, a much stronger force than either the electrostatic force or the gravitational force, and the name of that stronger force that holds the protons and the neutrons, by the way, together in the nucleus is the strong nuclear force. What else would you call it? You'd call it the strong nuclear force. At this time, I would like to introduce you to the four fundamental forces of nature. Here we go. We got three of them so far. Okay, the four fundamental forces of nature. The strongest one of all is the strong nuclear force. Next in line, in terms of strength, would be the electromagnetic force. Electromagnetic force. After that would be the weak force, the weak force. And finally, the weakest force in the entire universe, this is going to be surprising to you, is the gravitational force, gravitational force. Now,
we would like to be able to explain all four forces using one theory. But scientists have been trying to do that, physicists especially, have been trying to do that for the past, oh, at least a hundred years or so. We're not quite there yet. What we have managed to do is to have one theory that describes the electromagnetic force and the weak force. These are described together by a theory of what we call the electroweak force. We've been able to put these two forces together. What we would also like to be able to do is to describe the strong nuclear force with the electroweak force, and if we were able to do that, we would call this the GUT, the gut, or the grand unified theory. The grand unified theory would be able to explain the strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak force all in one theory. We can't do that yet. So far we're only here. Now, what we would really like to be able to do is explain the gravitational force and the other three all together, and we would call that, see what we got here, we would call that the TOE, the theory of everything. And I think you know that there is a movie out now called The Theory of Everything. It's about Stephen Hawking's life, a very famous physicist. And he's been working on the theory of, every, of everything. He's, he's getting there. He and thousands of physicists all over the world are trying to get to the theory of everything, where all four natural forces can all be described by one theory. It would be nice, but we're not there yet. All right, what I'd like to do next is to talk a little bit about each of these four fundamental forces of nature. I'd like to talk about the particles that they act between, the effect of these forces on the particles, the relative strengths, the relative ranges, how far apart the particles can be for these forces to act, and also the carrier particles, like for example the basketball analogy, the basketball would be a carrier particle, the carrier particles that each of these forces require in order to have the particles in nature interacting. So let's do that. Let's talk about the strong nuclear force first, then the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and finally the gravitational force. Here we go. Now, what you're probably going to want to do if you're taking notes is to orient your paper landscape and I'm going to write across here and then across here. What you should probably do on your paper is go straight across with approximately one, two, three, four, five, maybe six columns across. Okay? So the title of this chart would be The Four Fundamental. forces of nature. That would be the title. Now, why don't you write that down? And what I'm going to do is erase that so I have a little more room for all my other information. But this chart, and again, hold your paper landscape, not portrait. Hold your paper this way. All right? And I'll show you how I think you should do your chart. All right. What we're going to do is the columns are going to be, first of all, the name of the force. Second of all, the particles, the force 
acts between. The particles, the force acts between. That's your second column. The effect of that force on the particles, the relative strength of that force relative to the other forces, the range of that force. So put, put this column over here on your paper, all right, the range, and the name of the carrier particles. And again, remember, the carrier particles are the basketball in that analogy that I did earlier in this section. All right, the first force, the strongest of the four fundamental forces, is the strong nuclear force. Now, what kind of particles does it act between? The strong nuclear force acts between quarks, and in acting between quarks, it is holding protons and neutrons because they're made out of quarks the strong nuclear force is holding the quarks together in the nucleus. This is the force that prevents the electrostatic force, positive, positive, from blowing apart every atom on Earth and in the universe. Every atom that's being held together is being held together by the strong nuclear force. The positive, positive of the electrostatic force would blow them apart, and the gravitational force that holds masses together, even tiny little masses like the protons, is not strong enough to hold them together. You need the strong nuclear force. This is how we knew to look for the strong nuclear force in the first place. Now, the effect is that the strong nuclear force holds quarks together. Now, you know when you hold for example, three quarks together, two up quarks and a down quark, that's a proton. So you have to hold the quarks together to make a proton, and then you have to hold protons and neutrons together to make the nucleus of every atom larger than simple hydrogen one. So the effect is to hold quarks together and then to hold the protons and neutrons that are made out of quarks together. Copy that down and I'm going to put one more very important piece of information up there as soon as you get that copied. The effect is to hold quarks together and to hold protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. Maybe you should put that hold protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. Okay? All right, now, what do we want to know? Something very important we want to know about the effect of the strong nuclear force. The effect of the strong nuclear force is generally attractive only. We don't talk too much about the rare instances where the strong nuclear force would be repulsive. Think of it as attractive only and very, very strong. Now, the strength. We're going to say that the strength is approximately 20. That's going to be compared to the other forces when we get their numbers up on our chart. <coughs> Excuse me. The range is very tiny. It's holding protons together. It's holding quarks together in protons. It's holding protons together in the nucleus. The range has to be very, very, very tiny. So the range is 10, is on the order of 10 to the negative 15. And the carrier particles, the basketball that's going back and forth between the quarks, are called gluons. Gee, that's a funny name. But they named it that on purpose because it's gluing the quarks together, it's gluing protons together, 
In essence, it is gluing together the entire world that we know, the entire universe that we know, is being held together by gluons carrying the strong force. Now, one other interesting piece of information about the strong force. The strong nuclear force gets stronger as the quarks get further away from each other. So they really want to stay together. Again, the nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, gets stronger as quarks or protons move further away from each other. That's kind of the opposite of the way the gravitational force or the electrostatic force works. You know that the gravitational force gets stronger as, things, as particles move closer together. All right. So we've covered the strong nuclear force. Oh, one other thing. Uh, gluons have zero mass, just like a photon of light. Gluons have zero mass. Another fun fact. Okay. The next force that we want to look at is the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force. All right, the electromagnetic force, electro, one word, magnetic force. The particles that it acts between are charged particles. The effect of the electromagnetic force <clears throat> is that opposites attract. Now, that can be opposite charges or opposite poles attract. So, for example, now again, electromagnetic. So you're talking about electro, that's positive and negative, charges. You're talking about magnetic, that's north and south poles. But it's all caused by the fact that, that particles can be charged. Now, opposite charges or poles attract. So, for example, a proton attracts an electron, and a north pole of a magnet attracts a south pole of a magnet. What other effect can be caused by the electromagnetic force? Well, like charges or poles, you know this, repel. So what that means is that positive and positive, two protons are going to repel, and two north poles of two magnets are going to repel. So they can... They can attract, they can repel. Right? Unlike the strong nuclear force, which is mostly attractive, this force attracts, repels, it can do it all. Now, some other, some specific effects in everyday life would be, for example, friction. Friction is caused by the charged particles in the top object attaching briefly to the charged ob uh, particles in the bottom object. So when, for example, you're pushing a heavy box across the floor, the, let's say, for example, the electrons in, in the, the, surface, the bottom surface of the box are attracting to the nuclei of the floor, of the atoms in the floor, and vice versa. The electrons in the atoms of the floor are attracting to the nuclei in the atoms at the bottom of the box. Now, they're not, uh, generally speaking, they're not strong enough to stop you from pushing small objects. You can overcome that force with your applied force, your contact force. But again, friction is caused by this electrostatic force. Uh, that's another name for it. Electrostatic force. All right, electrostatic force or electromagnetic force. All right. Uh, friction magnetism, magnetism is caused by this force, the electromagnetic force, of course, and also the field of electrostatics, and a lot to do with all of the electronics that we have now um, operate because of this force, because like charges, 
repel and opposite charges attract, enables all of our um, electronic gadgetry to operate. So again, very, very important in everyday life. Now, the strength of this force. We're going to say the strength of this force is 1. So we're using this force as our reference, and if you remember, we said that the strong nuclear force was approximately 20 times stronger than this electrostatic force, because we said the strong nuclear force was 20, and we're calling this 1 in, in reference. All right, now, the last two things that we wanted to talk about, did you write all of this down? And remember, you're going across your, your chart. Um, you've got the opposites attract, like charges repel, it's friction, it's magnetism, it's electrostatics, it's all of our, all of our modern day electronics. All right, now, what about the range? The range of the electrostatic force. We did those in caps, didn't we? Okay, the range of the electrostatic force is infinite. It has an infinite range, very different from the strong nuclear force, which has a tiny, tiny, tiny range. The electrostatic force, the electromagnetic force, has an infinite range, and the carrier particle for the electrostatic force is our old friend, the photon. The carrier particle is the photon, photons of light. And again, they have zero mass, just like the gluons of strong nuclear force fame. So that's the carrier particle for the electromagnetic force. <clears throat> All right, now, the next force I'd like to talk about, the weak force. Now, there isn't a lot to say about the weak force. It doesn't, there aren't, we, we don't study a lot about the weak force in first year physics, but I will give you as much of this information, uh, relatively speaking, as we can. All right, the weak force, and perhaps you remember that the electromagnetic force and the weak force are already unified by electroweak theory. Now, the particles the force acts between, um, I'm not really going to specify that because this, is, this force is a little different than the other three forces. So what I'm going to do instead is to just list the effect of this, uh, this force. The effect of this force is um, to allow radioactive decay. To allow radioactive decay. Um, for example, beta decay. You can copy that down. I've got one more thing to write there. So copy that. The strength of this force is approximately 10 to the negative 7. All right, so this force, it's, it's starting to get very, very small compared to the other two. If the electromagnetic force has a, a strength of 1, this is 10 to the negative 7 compared to that. Very, very small. The, the range is um, 10 to the negative 18. In other words, this is another one of those forces like the strong nuclear force that has a tiny, tiny little range. It only acts when particles are very, very, very close to each other. The carrier particle would be a, a W plus, a W minus, or a Z neutral, and these are called bosons. These are very massive. They're, they do not have zero mass like the gluons and the photons of the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force. These are massive particles. They're a little bit heavier than you would imagine for little particles. Now, the effect would be to allow radioactive decay. What's actually happening, what's actually happening is that the flavor of a quark is changing. So you can change, you can change an up quark into a down quark, a down quark into an up quark, and that's partly how radioactive decay occurs. Because you're changing, for example, a neutron into a proton by changing the quark constituents. 
we know that a proton, a proton would be up, well, well, let's talk about the neutron first. You know that a neutron would be up, down, down. If you were able to change one of these downs into an up, 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 down, now you have a proton. So when you change the flavor of the quark, you can change, for example, a neutron into a proton and emit a beta particle. And again, that's what's happening in radioactive beta decay. So that's what we want to say about the weak force in terms of its effect in nature. All right, now, um, let's get into our last force, the gravitational force. Um, we, we know a lot about the effects of gravity. We have that equation, F G equals G M1 M2 over R squared, so we can calculate the, um, the gravitational force, the strength of the gravitational force, easily. Uh, but there are some things about the gravitational force that we have not seen yet um, and aren't exactly certain about yet. So let's, let's get into that. The range and the carrier particle. All right, here we go. Uh, the last force, the weakest of the four fundamental forces is the gravitational force. I'll prove that to you. All right? Um, I have here a grapefruit, and I am going to do battle with the gravitational force and see if I can get this, this grapefruit to work, to go against the gravitational force. Now, you know the gravitational force causes the weight of the grapefruit. The gravitational force is keeping the grapefruit down. Well, guess what? I win. The gravitational force is the weakest of the four fundamental forces. Would you like to see that again? I will do battle against gravity. Here we go. All right, let's see who wins. All right? I win. I hope that will help you to remember that the gravitational force is the weakest of the four fundamental forces. Okay, let's look at some of this other information. The name, of course, gravitational force. Gravitational force. The particles that the force acts between are any particles that have mass. Any particles that have mass. The effect is that it causes particles with mass to attract each other. That's right. The gravitational force is only attractive. It is an attractive force only. The strength of the gravitational force, we already said it's very, very weak. The strength of the gravitational force, 10 to the negative 36, compared to the 1 that we assigned earlier to the electromagnetic force. Much, much weaker than the electromagnetic force. The range, well, it's got to be able to hold the universe together. The range is infinite. The range of the gravitational force is infinite. It's, it's holding, for example, uh, Pluto in orbit around the sun. Okay, it's holding Jupiter, um, a massive planet, in orbit around the sun. So it's got to have a really, really big range. We say that the range is infinite. And the carrier particle, well, we, we theorize that there is a particle called a gravitron. Gravitron, graviton, graviton, sorry. Graviton. All right, graviton. But uh, we haven't seen it yet. We have seen no evidence of the graviton yet. And that's not for lack of, of looking. There are plenty of scientists trying to detect gravitons. All right, so um, that about sums up the four fundamental forces of nature. All right, just to, um, just to uh, summarize a little bit, we've got the strong nuclear force, 
which is the strongest of the four forces. The carrier particle is the gluon, and it holds quarks together in protons and neutrons, and it holds protons together in the nucleus of all of the atoms in the universe. We have the electromagnetic force, which is the next strongest. It causes attractions between positive and negatively charged particles, or between north and south poles, and it causes repulsion between likely light charged particles, such as positive and positive, would repel, or north pole to north pole would repel. So again, the strong nuclear force is only attractive. The electromagnetic force is attractive or repulsive. The weak force is what's responsible for radioactive decay. It allows quarks to change their flavor. And when you can change one quark into a different quark, you can change, for example, UDD, the neutron, into UUD, the proton. And finally, the weakest of the four fundamental forces is gravity, the gravitational force. The gravitational force is only an attractive force. It attracts all masses. It can attract two protons together. It can attract the Sun and Jupiter together. Because two protons have mass, they attract via the gravitational force. Because a, uh, the Sun and Jupiter have mass, they attract via the gravitational force. Now again, looking at two protons, you've got several different forces either attracting or repelling, and ultimately what happens with those two protons? Well, two protons would be repelled by the electromagnetic force. They would explode apart. They try to stay together because of the gravitational force, but the gravitational force is not strong enough to overcome the positive-positive repulsive force of the electromagnetic force. So, we need a third force to actually hold them together in the nucleus. But that third force, the strong nuclear force, only works at very, very tiny distances. So the nucleus has to be very, very tiny. And then, the strong nuclear force is able, able to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion, positive, positive. The strong nuclear force wins and holds them together, right, even though the gravitational force is not strong enough to do so. This concludes the modern physics topic. This was the last section in modern physics. If there's anything you'd like to review, you can go back to another topic or back to any other section that you're having difficulties with. Thank you.